this is not your NPS score. This is not your net promoter no, definitely score. Not. It sounds no. It sound. I just want to clarify that for the audience. It sounds like it when you say, "Oh, they're they're movable. They have some propensity to engage. Are they my loyalists? Are they my neutrals? Are they my detractors?" Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for business leaders who are looking to boost the ROI from their investments in customer experience and culture together. Uh, today, I'm joined by Joel Rubinson, who is the president of Rubinson Partners, uh, and he's uh, closely involved in marketing research and advanced analytics. And Joel and I are both subject experts at MMA Global, the Marketing Trade Association, and Joel's been leading the charge on a lot of the work related to marketing attribution and the movable middle growth framework and some other things that we'll talk about today. Thanks for joining, Joel. Sure. Pleasure to do so. Thank you. Joel, just to um, get us started, um, do you want to share a little bit more about the movable middle growth framework that I just mentioned? This is a uh, one of the areas that I was really excited to learn more about when I started getting involved in MMA is the um, experiments and the things that we do that are with members to kind of move the stock price. And I, I, this is one that uh, when we had Greg on the podcast, the CEO of MMA Global, he talked a little bit about Google Middle Growth Framework and I actually give a shout out to it in my book, The CX and Culture Connection. So we really excited to have you, the creator of this, on the on the podcast to talk more about it today. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So um, I've always thought that there must be a connection between someone's probability of choosing a particular brand and not only their baseline probability of buying it, but also their responsiveness to advertising. And just logically, for example, if somebody has exhibited, say, from shopper data that they haven't bought your brand over the past year or two years. So you might say, okay, in a calculation, I'm going to say that they're at zero in terms of their, you know, prior uh, history in terms of likelihood to buy. But think of it as if they're, if they haven't bought you, that means that they have ignored your advertising and your promotions and your shelf presence consistently through time because presumably they've been exposed to it. You know, if you're advertising on TV, eventually everybody is seeing it. So so the, the metaphor I like to use is, have you ever seen the video of kids bouncing basketballs and you're supposed to count like how many times the kids with the white shirts are bouncing the basketballs and in the middle, someone walks out in a gorilla suit and no one sees the gorilla because you're so focused on the task of counting how many times they're bouncing basketballs in this chaotic scene. Well, for people who have no likelihood of buying you, you're actually the, the, the gorilla. They don't see your advertising. They don't care about your advertising. It's a principle of uh, psychologists would call it inattentional blindness. Behavioral ec economists would call it uh, non-compensatory decision-making, meaning they only see those things that are relevant to the to the decision that they're going to make. So I said, well, if if people who are not interested in your brand are not responsive to your advertising either, first of all, can I prove that? And second of all, how important is that? Right. Well, I do a lot of work with uh distributions of consumer preferences and it turns out they're extremely predictable if you know the market share for a brand and you know its repeat rate that is what percent of people buy it twice in a row you actually can predict with 99 percent accuracy what the distribution of consumer purchases looks like for that particular brand and using that knowledge and that statistical modeling, I know for the great majority of brands which have a 10 share or less, more than 80% of consumers have really no interest in buying your brand. They're at the zero point on that curve or clo very close to zero. So I said, you know, let's explore if we can find a relationship between loyalty, probability of purchase, 
and responsiveness to advertising. And through the work that we did in partnership with New Star, now called TransUnion, uh, also data shared with us by Numerator, they shared a ton of receipt scanning data across seven, categ seven categories and something like 45 brands. What happened was when we did modeling off the data that we had, we said, wow, it looks like it's people in the middle of the curve, those with around a 50% probability of purchase who have the greatest responsiveness. And then we built the theory from there and it turned out that those who have between a 20 and an 80% probability of choosing your brand will have, on average, five times more responsiveness to your advertising. Not 5%, five times. Now, in validation work that we've done, mostly via the MMA, so far we've seen up to 23 times. We have not seen one situation where the movable middle was not multiples higher in their responsiveness to advertising. So that's that's where the movable middle, you know, came from. Just to play this back for the audience, um, and this is very powerful stuff. You know, with a lot of advertising, people focus on the return on ad spend and you know, spend a dollar, how much do you get back? And a lot of the times, you know, you'll see a like one point five to three X ROAS. You know, and then what people will often do with their models is look at them how much higher that goes if you have better advertising. And you could say, well, does it go from two to three X or two to four X? What you're saying is gonna be five times as high, you know, which is a massive lift to to get. Yeah, even up to even up to twenty three times as high. To to put it in an even broader framework, I guess one of the other motivating ideas was this. I think of marketing or advertising effectiveness as a three-legged stool, okay? There's how good is the creative? How well are you choosing the right channels and partners and tactics? And the third leg is how well are you targeting and selecting those consumers who have interest in your offer, okay? That third leg I felt had no science behind it in in the general you know industry practice the first the creative there's a ton of work that goes into making sure you have the right creative there's pre-testing uh, th there's all kinds of stuff now there's AI you know to optimize so that you're you're manipulating creative elements specifically for the individual ID based on what you know or the context of the placement. Okay, in terms of tactics and channels, well, you have marketing mix modeling, you have MTA. Everybody gives you a lift study if you spend enough money with them. So there's tremendous insight about that. But what about targeting? In fact, there are persuasive voices out there, false sirens, I will say, who say you shouldn't do any targeting. Now, what you should do is use the broadest reach possible. Okay, so the math that we have now validated in 10 out of 10 cases would prove that broad reach is actually madness. So we are trying to make that as known as possible. Now, the MMA has a huge membership. So as we broadcast this, you know, that's quite a megaphone. So as, as we broadcast this message and also work one-on-one -on -one with individual marketers to describe the theory, we definitely are getting the message out. I'll hear from people I know, hey, you know, I love your movable middle stuff. I never discussed it with them. They just see my posts on LinkedIn or whatever, you know. So the message is uh, definitely getting out there, which is which is really good because, listen, if marketing works better, it's better for the whole ecosystem. And you know what? It's better for consumers because how does a relevant advertising benefit individual consumers? It doesn't. Relevant advertising does. This, um, you know, resonates a lot with me on two levels. And just to share two, you know, analogies that help me internalize this, Joel, with our audience. You know, having worked earlier in my career in the media practice at Booz and then going from media to marketing and customer experience over my career, I'm still very sensitive to like the, some of the learnings from media over the years. Um, 
And I learned a lot about this notion of being endemic and being a relevant environment. And like, for example, if you advertise in the food network and you're a food brand, people are more engaged with the advertising because it's more relevant, right, to them. Similarly, if you do eye tracking studies and it's less endemic, it's like the ads are invisible. So a lot of the times when you, if you put a food ad in a newspaper, or general news site, it's like they're invisible. People don't even see them because it's not relevant to the content. What you're highlighting is that there's another aspect of relevance, which is not just the environment the ad is in, which is the way a lot of advertising has been done is targeting has been demographic, uh, contextual or behavioral, right? And contextual is putting in the right environment. Um, and that can have lift because people pay attention. It, it, you know, it's the old adage, the perfect man smell better and vote. They're better. It's, it's more relevant environment and a premium environment. Well, this means that the brand has relevance to the consumers too. And people haven't paid attention to this notion of propensity to engage enough because they haven't had the data. And that now that we can actually have data about the context in which the individual consumer views the brand, not just the environment they see the ad in, you can actually avoid wasting your ads on people for whom they're invisible. I mean, that's absolutely true. And the notion of using a, a brand uh, propensity or brand preference lens to think about a, a targeting model is um, it's really quite different from the practice that a lot of people engage in it'll manifest itself in conversations like, you know, well, we, we target women who are 25 to 54. That's how we buy our media. Okay. It's a broad demographic target, makes sense, has very little discrimination or, you know, relevance to figuring out who's really interested in your product. You know, sometimes- People did it for expediency. They did it for expediency historically because- this is how the media got sold. It's the way the media planning data research is provided. It's supposed to like, you know, now that we have better data about who your audience is, I'd love to get you to share more about how do you actually measure that propensity and how can we take some of the learnings of M a movable little growth framework and scale them more as, as so, you know, to be able to find and target those audiences on an ongoing basis. All right. So how, you, how do you measure propensity? So the, the easy one is if you have frequent shopper data or you have location data, if you're a retailer, then you have a history for every individual ID and it's easy to tag people. If 20 to 80 percent of their purchases or their visits have been for your brand, they're in the movable middle. OK. But not everybody has that kind of data or is in that kind of business. So another way to do it, what we've used with great success, is a survey. And this is something you can use in your brand trackers. Most people have brand trackers where they do thousands of interviews, you know, every every year and they accumulate data. Well, all you have to do Yeah, all you have to do is put a constant sum question in your tracker, which is basically you know, if you were to um, open a new bank account or if you were to buy or lease a new vehicle or if you whatever the situation is, you ask people to divide up 10 points across those brands that they would consider and they can give 10 points to one brand. They can give zero points to other brands or anything in the middle as long as the total adds to 10. From that data, we can identify which survey panelists are in the movable middle. Okay, now here's what you do with that. Let's say you have a thousand respondents that you've accumulated from your tracker who are in the movable middle, okay? What if you've used the survey panel that's on that's onboarded? So there's live ramp IDs or Experian or and I would strongly urge any anyone to do that, by the way, not use a panel that isn't onboarded. What you want to be able to do is onboard that data. Now you can see 
Where are the movable, what TV shows are the movable middles watching using smart TV data? What stores are they shopping in? Where do they live? Uh, uh, what, uh, what characteristics do they have as flagged in the uh, DSP that I use or in the data backbone that my agency has so I can do lookalike modeling? of these of these movable middles what you're highlighting is if you have as a brand a modern approach for ongoing tracking of your current and potential shoppers you know whether your cpg or financial services or other categories travel health etc if you're engaging on your brand it's a best practice to have a tracker study to measure things like brand health and other questions so if you do this using Platforms like Qualtrics, for example, or other survey platforms, you can you can do a tracker study, and then you can build this additional metric for propensity. And to be clear, this is not your NPS score. This is not your net no, promoter definitely score. Not. It sounds no. It sounds. I just want to clarify that for the audience. It sounds like it when you say, "Oh, they're they're movable. They have some propensity to engage. Are they my loyalists? Are they my neutrals? Are they my detractors?" This is actually a different metric that uh, is, is calculated differently. And it allows you to actually not only do, I, I think this is a powerful thing, not only to do the mobile middle for advertising, but to also start thinking about your personas and your segments and how they map to your mobile middle and start designing your experience for them. And actually think about that's the next frontier, I think is beyond advertising is think about customer experience and how we can apply the same lens there. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And I think, you know, when you dig into why people are in the movable middle, you'll find they're differentiated by certain characteristics or beliefs or life stages or whatever. Now you'll have a much more meaningful way of segmenting and, and profiling IDs. By the way, there is one other thing, Matt, and that is if you uh, have a first party list, and you look at the percent of people, let's say active customers, lapsed customers, those who went to your website, you know, look who had interest in your brand in some way or other, and you were to, to uh, onboard the survey data against those populations, you're gonna find repeatable patterns. So at some point, you don't need the survey data to tell you how to use your first party assets to target movable middle because you've established a repeatable pattern in all of that. One of the most clear patterns to me that I've seen based on research I've done is fans and followers in social media. People like you in real life before they like you in social media. So the movable middle is really high among the fans you have, you know, on Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever. So they they become available audiences to you. I don't I think marketers underestimate maybe meta itself underestimates the value of profiling people in that way to target the movable middle. So there's a lot of audiences. The the list the way in which you implement this process should not only just be a numerical exercise of profiling audiences you're thinking of, it should make you think of new audiences. Anyway, but I do want to get on to the point that you raised about going beyond advertising. So uh, I think it does have relevance there. So ask away. <laughs> well, thank you. And this is an area that I'm excited to continue to collaborate on and given our, both our roles in, um, MMA, and, it, and it's an area I called out in my book, The CX and Culture Connection, is that there's immediate value on advertising to go down this path. And there's additional areas to pursue with customer experience because in customer experience, we want to build loyalty and we want to engage people and improve their brand favorability and their propensity to engage with our brand to get them further up that score. And the return on investment you know, is high in a loyalist because you don't want to lose that. Sorry, the this customer lifetime value of a loyalist is high because they, they they will stay a long time and spend a lot with you. That doesn't mean the incremental return of investing and in improving the experience for a loyalist is higher. 
than for move middle. I think this is an area to explore further. Is, is, is the same result true where the ROI of investing in the move middle is higher in advertising? Intuitively, it makes sense that if you go after the move middle and convert them to loyalists or convert them to customers and later to loyalists, it will have a higher ROI than spending on someone who's already a loyalist. First of all, uh, when you think about your customers... Marketer, I when I speak to marketers, I hear a lot of hubris. You know, they're my customers. No, they're not your customers. You only share them in most cases. You know, so you have a share of wallet of their business, and um, and so you are you're fighting for that next purchase, or you're fighting to keep them at whatever decision point that they happen to be at. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we find that the movable middle percentage among existing customers is really high, which reinforces the fact that you don't own them. You only share them. Okay. Um, but what that means is in the work that we've done, we find that they're very responsive to paid media. So don't think that just because you send them emails and text messages, you know, twice a week, that you're doing enough to keep those customers. Advertising is important and any anything else that you can do to show love to them, you know, if, listen, I don't know the economics of this, but if you want to keep me as a customer for life, have a human being answer the phone when I call, for God's sakes, <laughs> instead of making me punch 12 different numbers and not get to where I want to get to. I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot that goes that, that goes into the engine inside of a consumer's you know mind that leads them to make predictions about who they want to buy from. You know, if someone's in the movable middle targeting them with advertising, clearly we've proven this has more ROI than targeting your loyalists or detractors for different reasons. Detractors are unlikely to switch and the loyalists you already have, right? Um, now, if you follow the whole customer journey and look at all the touch points you have with someone and someone's in the Google middle, they see your ads, they're engaging with your ads, you know, more than a detractor, right? Um, not as much as a loyalist, but there's value in converting them. Right, there's higher value in in converting the movable middle because they aren't already buying you as much. But they, if they if they have a if they have a bad call center experience, or they have a bad experience in the store, or the website doesn't work, these also influence them. All these other things on the path to purchase also influence them. So that's a future opportunity is to convert the movable middle through the full experience, not just the advertising. I completely agree. You know, I. I've often said, you know, we think of brand loyalty kind of a, as a metric to keep our eye on. You know, it's a KPI, but it's really a one way metric. It's like how much loyalty does our brand have among consumers? Well, you don't want consumer. You, you can't really expect consumers to show loyalty to you unless you're also showing loyalty to them. So what are you doing to make them feel special, you know? And yeah, so advertising is part of it, but the touches that people have through, you know, calling in because they have an issue or, you know, the bill they get, I mean, even the bill, I mean, you know, unless they're on auto pay and they don't see a bill, I mean, they're, they're getting a message from you every month that relates to finance. I mean, you have a lot of opportunity to to show them some love, you know, in that way. Now, do marketers think of that? I don't know, sometimes. Some bills are structured, I think, better than others in terms of, you know, uh, uh, indicating that someone is special. I happen to like the, uh, the jet blue statements that I get, you know, it's like, you know, you're blue, you're true blue or something like that. You know, it's, uh, it's, it doesn't take a lot. You know, your highlights, there's a lot of opportunities in experience design and customer experience to pay attention to your customers and their propensity to engage with you and tailor your design efforts based on that. And we're really just at the beginning of having the data available 
to do this better. You know, like what you're, what's so exciting is you're showing a way to do it in advertising. Now we can start doing it in a more data-driven way in other places where you turn your segments into more actionable audiences. You turn your segments into actionable approaches where you can test and learn versus, which is what we're doing in advertising. We can do a lot more of in customer experience in the future as a repeat this test and learn approach. Let me also say it this way. What do you... What situation do you think a consumer wants to be in? One where there are five brands that they're considering and they have to do a deep analysis every time to figure out who they want to stay with or who they want to buy, or to have a brand that they love and trust and they know will never let them down. What situation do you think somebody wants to be in? They'd always rather exert less effort, so the latter. Absolutely. So they want to be where you want them to be. So let them get there, you know, stop standing in their way, you know, let them get there. And part of letting them get there, by the way, is give them a brand narrative. You know, they might have found your brand because they saw it on the shelf. Or they might have found your brand because they did a Google search. That doesn't mean they know who, who started the business that it was started in someone's garage or that, you know, a certain company didn't hire a certain person. So he, he or she went and built the business themselves. And then eventually that same company bought the business. Or in the case of Ring Doorbell, you know, the, they went on Shark Tank and they didn't get a good enough offer. And so they said, the hell with it. I'm just going to do it myself. And then they sold the business for, I think it was $4 billion to Amazon. Those are great stories. Tell people your stories. The best book on branding I've read is by uh, Pat Hanlon, Primal Branding. And he makes this point so clearly about what you have to communicate. So I think a lot of marketers forget that they have a story to tell to their customers. Just because they're customers, that doesn't mean they know your story. You know, Joel, this has been uh, really fun. And um, I know it's sparked a lot of ideas for me. I always enjoy your interactions. Um, what can people do to learn more about um, the work you're doing with MMA on Google Middle? What's the best way for them to learn more and get involved? If they are members of MMA, they have points of contact. They should reach out and then, you know, I'll I'll be brought in. There's a few of us now who, who work with Movable Middle and we 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 help any marketer out. But if if not, they can always email you, email me. I don't know if you provide my email address in any of this. But uh, well, it's um yeah, we'll 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 put it on screen and, and mine as well. Yeah, get the ball rolling. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I mean I'm sure that emails have magically appeared on the screen as we're talking. Um, <laughs> and uh, people should definitely feel free to reach out over email or LinkedIn to either of us. It's definitely another way to get in contact. And uh, um, Joel, I'm really excited that um, we're collaborating at MMA Global. It's a great organization. You're doing great work there. And I'm, I, I'm glad to uh, be part of that with you all and, and look forward to future collaboration. Yeah, yeah, and I feel exactly the same way. Thank you. So, thanks for inviting me to do this. Also, Matt, appreciate it. It's uh, it's my pleasure, Joel. And for our audience, I, I hope this has sparked some great ideas for you. I'm looking forward to the conversations that you'll have with us uh, in the future. 